Congress, and thank you so much, Chairman, for drawing attention to it, and I really hope we can see it expedited. Dialogue to resolve this conflict remains frozen, as it has been for 13 years, due to Chinese authorities' refusal to meet with the Dalai Lama or his representatives. Our legislation aims to bolster existing U.S. policy seeking meaningful and direct dialogue without preconditions to lead to a negotiated agreement on Tibet. The Tibetan people, like, like people everywhere, deserve a say in how they are governed. The right to self-determination is foundational to the concept of universal human rights. Enshrined in the UN Charter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Yet the Chinese government's policies preclude Tibetans from exercising that most basic right. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on what those fighting for the rights of Tibetans can do about this. And I invite our witnesses to share their perspectives on how all of us can do better to protect and support Tibet's linguistic, religious, and cultural heritage. Much has been done in this area over the decades through the works of the Dalai Lama and the Central Tibetan Administration. Yet as today's testimony will reinforce Chinese authorities' frontal assault on Tibetan language and culture now brings elevated challenges, such as the Chinese attempt to erase Tibetans' Tibetanness. The vast majority of Tibetan children are now placed in colonial boarding schools, as the chairman has referred to. Some 80% of the children, 6 to 18, being placed in these schools. Children now even in preschool being put into these schools. This story gets worse with each passing month. The people of Tibet face urgent challenges, and I hope today's hearing will help us understand better how we can support them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to now <coughs> yield to uh, Congressman Dunn. Okay. We do have a member on remotely, uh, uh, Representative Steele, if we could... She's, she's remote. I'm sorry. Okay, I'd like to yield to a member of the State Department. You know, one of the uniqueness of this commission is that we do have members of the State Department. It is the China Executive Commission, which makes it very, very unique. I'd like to yield to her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we will come back. Uh, Congresswoman Steele. Uh, actually, Mr. Chairman, yes. is it okay? Can okay. you hear me? Yes, we can. So, so, thank you, Chairman, for hosting this important hearing. And every person has the right to religious and cultural beliefs. All governments, including the CCP, have no right to restrict these fundamental beliefs. It was an honor to meet the 14th Dalai Lama in 2016. It is inexcusable that the people of Tibet are not free and are currently met with punishment, ranging from warnings and surveillance to interrogation and detention. We cannot sit by while the Tibetans are being detained and imprisoned for political or religious reasons. So to all the witnesses, the CCP continues to have oversight on Tibetan religious life by mandating political education for monks and nuns, can you believe, creating apparatus to surveil and manage monastic uh, institutions. Can you expand more on how the CCP authorities continue to reorient Tibetan society? Okay, uh, thank you. We will ask that the panel respond to that after we get through all of their very important opening statements. And I uh, would like to now yield to uh, uh, Congressman Dunn. First of all, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, uh, for scheduling this important hearing to examine uh, the impact of Chinese Communist Party's repressive rule on Tibetans. And I look forward to the testimony today from this august panel who's taken time to be with us. I also want to express my gratitude for serving on this bipartisan, bicameral commission. Uh, my colleagues in the House as well as in the Senate and the executive branch who are with us. It's a privilege for the opportunity to participate because I believe very strongly that this is a critical examination of what needs to be done to ensure that China's compliance with international human rights standards are held firm. 
Look, as a former intelligence officer myself with nearly two decades of experience both in the military and then working in counterintelligence operations inside of China, I've seen firsthand the national and the economic threat posed by China's global interests. And we've seen throughout the course of recent events, China will do whatever it takes for that level of global domination. In Wang Ji's book, 36 Stratagems, he highlights a theory uh, that is steeped in Chinese cultural history, this idea of sacrificing the plum tree to preserve the peach tree. And what they mean by this is that you can sacrifice in the short term those who are most vulnerable for the strength of those who are in power. We are seeing this played out constantly in the autonomous state of Tibet today by the Chinese government. The even individuals who are here in this room today know that the Chinese government is relentless in its approach to apply advanced technology to repress and track its very own people. Intrusive electronic surveillance is prevalent at every level. With this fact alone, it is cause for concern. The forced and often arbitrary collection of sensitive biometric information on millions of Tibetans and other local residents by their government officials is both dangerous it is repressive and is a clear violation of basic human rights. By leveraging this technology, the Chinese government can identify people who not only their face, but also make up their cellular data, the very essence of who they are. The Tibetan population is put in serious risk of genealogical repression for future generations who are targeted on the basis of their DNA. In fact, between 2016 and 2022, the DNA collection program in the Tibetan Autonomous Region is believed to have cataloged as many as 1.2 million, approximately a third of the entire population of this region. And worse yet, Chinese authorities are targeting this data collection, as the chairman highlighted, in an effort on uh, primary schools where they're taking blood from children as young as five years old. All of this done without any parental notification or consent. China's pervasive surveillance technology does not stop at the Tibetan border. The CCP's repression efforts extend to Tibetan communities abroad and is further evidence of the extreme lengths the Communist Party will go to undertake the dismantlement of the entire Tibetan civilization. This biometric data is a legitimate threat that will only deepen the CCP's control against indigenous populations around the globe. Violating international norms and concerns with privacy and the ultimate use of this biometric data as a basic human rights deserve protection no matter where they are in the world. And so, Mr. Chair, before I conclude my opening statement, I want to make my position on the United States companies selling technology to China today very clear. Any U.S. company transacting with the Chinese government to sell technology that can be used to further the Chinese government's repression are equally complicit. China's blatant human rights violations should immediately be clear, and those companies need to sever their ties with these violators. So again, to both the Chairman and the House and the Senate, I look forward to our witnesses' statements today, the recommendations that you're providing to us so that we can take constructive action on this and make sure that China does not use their authoritarian surveillance or put others in a place where they also become subject to this type of totalitarian state. With that, I yield back the remainder of my time and thank the panel for being here today. Uh, thank you so very much for your very strong statement. Thanks, sir. We welcome you to the commission and look forward to your, for your leadership, uh, which will be greatly appreciated. The uh, Under Secretary of State, Anzra Zaya, is here um, uh, remotely. She's going to now uh, provide her opening comments as well. Thank you, Representative Smith, Senator Merkley, and my fellow distinguished commissioners for the opportunity to speak today on this timely and important topic. And I'd like to welcome our distinguished guests, Sikyong Serding, Mr. Gear, Ms. Tetong, and Mr. Dorji, whose valuable insights I look forward to hearing. We're gathered here today at a critical moment for Tibet. PRC authorities continue to wage a campaign of repression that seeks to forcibly sinicize the six million Tibetans in the PRC and eliminate Tibet's distinct religious, cultural, and linguistic heritage. Recent reports on government-run boarding schools and involuntary mass DNA collection in Tibetan areas shock the conscience. These policies targeting ethnic minorities and religious practitioners are part of broader PRC efforts to reshape 
and undermine human rights globally, including through various acts of transnational repression. This administration will continue to shine a light on Tibet-related issues within our broader human rights concerns with the PRC, bilaterally and jointly with multilateral partners, and promote accountability for the PRC's human rights abuses in Tibet and elsewhere. As U.S. Special Coordinator for Tibetan Issues, I am committed to continuing this administration's close and sustained cooperation with Congress to deepen our strong track record of support to the Tibetan community and uphold an affirmative vision for human rights. Thank you. I'd also like to put forward two questions to our distinguished panelists. First, as we know, the PRC subjects Tibetans to intense surveillance and draconian controls over the flow of information, including the simple act to talking to those outside the PRC. These threats extend outside the PRC as authorities target Tibetans through in-person and virtual harassment, as well as threats to family and friends still living inside the PRC. <clears throat> Understanding the impenetrability of the Great Firewall, how can we improve information flow into and out of the Tibetan Autonomous Region? My second question is as U.S. Special Coordinator for Tibetan Issues, I've prioritized engagement with our <laughs> partners and allies to enlist multilateral support for the global Tibetan community, especially on the issue of the Dalai Lama's succession. I would welcome our panelists' recommendations on how the international community can continue to elevate this issue multilaterally and what actions that you've seen as most effective to challenging PRC narratives. Thank you. Thank you very much, thank Madam Secretary, much. and uh, thank you for those excellent questions, which I know the panel will uh, look forward to answering. I would like to welcome, again, an, an incredibly distinguished panel, beginning with the uh, Sikyong of the Central Tibetan Administration, uh, Penpa Sering. He's the leader of the Tibet's government in exile, uh, known as the Central Tibetan Administration. Uh, he was sworn in as the Sikyong at a official ceremony graced by His Holiness himself, the Dalai Lama, on May 27th, 2021. Uh, Mr. Seirang's service to the Tibetan cause and people includes his election in 1996 to the Tibetan Parliament in Exile, employing his knowledge of economics. Uh, he also served in the Parliament's Budget Estimate Committee multiple times. Uh, in 2001, he was re-elected as a member of the Tibetan Parliament, uh, during which time he took as the role of executive director of the Tibetan Parliamentary and Policy Research Center, a research agency based in New Delhi. As executive director, his outreach efforts directed towards Indian political leaders led to the successful revival of the all-party Indian parliamentary forum for Tibet. In 2008, after his re-election to a third term as a member of the Tibetan Parliament, he was elected as the Speaker of the 14th Tibetan Parliament in exile, and in 2011, uh, he was again elected as Speaker. Uh, he is a tremendous diplomat. Uh, many of us who have met him are, are just very much impressed with his skills, his diplomacy, and his compassion. Uh, and he will be coming to us remotely from India, uh, and he will be our first witness. Our next witness, no stranger to the Congress, House and Senate, and to this commission, uh, a true champion of human rights and democracy and for the people of Tibet is Richard Gere. He's chairman of the board of directors for the International Campaign for Tibet. Uh, he's a very successful actor, uh, and I've seen, and my wife, most of his movies. We loved them. Um, First Night was my favorite, but there's many other good ones in there. Um, he's an amazing humanitarian, uh, as I said, and a man of tremendous compassion. For more than 30 years, he has worked uh, not only to draw attention to the situation in Tibet and His Holiness, but also to provide practical resolutions and solutions to the humanitarian crisis that is rooted in injustice, inequality, and uh, intolerance. Um, he also campaigned for awareness and education in HIV AIDS affected communities. Uh, he has helped to build the first female dormitory in India for HIV positive women, their children, and HIV positive orphans. In 1991, he founded the Gear Foundation, a private 
Foundation focused on advocacy, education, human rights, and cultural preservation. Richard has also used his popularity uh, and, again, his very articulate voice to amplify uh, the nonviolent struggle for Tibet, uh, which he brings to us again today. He's co-founder and chairman of the Tibet U.S. House uh, in 1987. He joined the International Campaign for Tibet's Board of Directors, where he has served as chairman since 1995. So I, I just want to thank him for that tenacious and long-standing leadership. Uh, it has made a difference. Uh, then, yeah. Thank you. Our next witness uh, will be Ladan Tae Dong, who is co-founder and director of the Tibetan Action Institute, uh, where she leads a team of technologists and rights advocates uh, developing open source technology strategies and training programs for Tibetans and others living under extreme <clears throat> repression. Formerly the executive director of Students for a Free Tibet International, uh, she has led the campaign against the 2008 Beijing Olympics. I uh, note parenthetically that Frank Wolf and I went over uh, and we tried very hard to get the IOC first not to award it and then went a couple weeks before and, and told everyone, including our own embassy, what a farce it was for all of these politicians to be flocking to that 2008 Olympics and I would say ditto for the one that just occurred. Um, that, that you don't become complicit in uh, an IOC uh, event uh, when Again, a genocide is occurring in real time. Uh, now we have another genocide that occurred in real time while another Olympics uh, was going on. She has testified before uh, this commission in the past. We, uh, she has num received a number of awards, uh, including the James Lawson Award for Nonviolent Achievement from the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict in 2011, and accepted the Democracy Award from the National Endowment for Democracy on behalf of Tibet Action Institute in 2000. 18. Tenzin Dorji is a senior research and strategist at Tibet Action Institute and a doctoral candidate at Columbia University's uh, Department of Political Science, focusing on the efficacy of nonviolent resistance strategies and the influence of religion. He has held leadership and programmatic roles at a number of organizations, including the National Endowment for Democracy and Students for a Free Tibet. Uh, he is uh, tender, as he is known by, to many of us as, um, is the author of The Tibet Nonviolent Struggle, A Strategic and Historical Analysis. His writings have appeared in the Washington Post, Foreign Policy Journal of Democracy, National Interest, Tibetan Review, and the Oxford Encyclopedia of Politics and Religion. Uh, he has also testified uh, before the uh, CAE, uh, our commission, uh, back in uh, just a couple of years ago. So I would like to now ask uh, if we could uh, hear from uh, Penpa Say Ring, uh, such time as he may consume. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman Smith, uh, Chairman Merkley, uh, members of the distinguished guests. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me for this hearing. And I'm very much encouraged by the presence of uh, Special Coordinator for Tibet, Under Secretary Azra Zeya, who, uh, who has been very diligently and wholeheartedly uh, fulfilling her responsibilities as, under, uh, as a Special Coordinator for Tibet. And I'm also very happy to be present here alongside a person who continues to play a very significant role in keeping the hopes of the Tibetan people alive and uh, someone whom I hold very dear, Mr. Richard Gere, Chairman of the International Campaign for Tibet. You have also invited two prominent Tibetans, Ladrin Tethong and Tenzin Dorji of the Tibet Act Action Institute, as you mentioned before. Both are very competent in their leadership and they are now known for their research on challenges confronting Tibetans inside Tibet, including the colonial style boarding schools. I'm sure with them speaking in detail on some of the specific issues, I request the chairs to consider my written submission as part of the testimony, uh, which covers almost uh, uh, the events over the last uh, one year. And as the democratic elected uh, leader of the Tibetan people, the Central Tibetan Administration, of which I am the Sikong, 
is fully committed to uh, following the middle way policy, the way forward shown by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and adopted by his, uh, the Tibetan parliament in exile. This policy is aimed at finding a non-violent, mutually beneficial, negotiated and lasting solution to the Sino-Tibet conflict that can set an example to this violence-ridden world. Resolution to the Sino-Tibet conflict can have profound geopolitical implications for a more peaceful and secure region and the world. The absence of traction on dialogue since 2010 sounds ominous, but we remain positive about finding a peaceful solution uh, uh, to the Sino-Tibet conflict. Uh, that avoids extreme polarities. The sincerity of the People's Republic of China's leadership manifests in the policies and programs being implemented in Tibet as we speak. In the last few years, evidence emerging out of uh, Tibet in the form of reports by the UN Independent Institute in, uh, UN, the independent institutes and scholarly research, the Chinese government's one nation, one language, one culture, and one religion is aimed at forced assimilation and the erasure of Tibetan national identity and other minority nationalities. Unsurprisingly, the international watchdog Freedom House lists Tibet as uh, one of the uh, most least free country in the world alongside Syria and South Sudan. We often uh, get asked as to why we don't hear about Tibet anymore. PRC's Ovalian gridlock system, use of all means of artificial intelligence, as the chairs mentioned, to surveil people, control the flow of information and lockdown of Tibet to the outside world, even those in leadership roles in education, religion, culture, and environment are being arbitrarily arrested or they just disappear. One's actions are linked to welfare of one's near and dear ones. 157 Tibetans were known to have self-immolated since 2009, hoping against hope that the PRC government would pay some attention to their plight and hoping against hope that the international community would come to their rescue, but to no avail. The Chinese government focuses too much on development and fails to understand the real aspirations of the Tibetan people. Tibetan language, religion, and culture are the bedrock of Tibetan identity. Compassion and nonviolence, which form the foundation of our culture, will undoubted, undoubtedly promote peace and harmony in the world. However, these are facing unprecedented threat of eradication. The atheist Chinese, Chinese government is trying to fully control the process and authority of recognizing the reincarnation of Trukus, or living Buddhas, as they say, that is unique to Tibetan Buddhism, besides interference in the study of Buddhist philosophy and control on their movement. To speed up assimilation, large-scale forced relocation of Tibetans from their traditional homeland to Chinese territories and in, within Tibet, mass transfers of Tibetan youth to China uh, are forcing all these uh, uh, Tibetans to be moved to other areas uh, that are not of their uh, traditional uh, culture. The, as part of the 50 years China's Western Development Program started at the beginning of this millennium, unscrupulous use of natural resources and reckless construction of dams, railways and road network, airports and other infrastructure in Tibet threatens irreversible damage to Tibet's fragile environment. Tibet is known as Asia's water tower and the third pole because of the amount of glaciers and permafrost that feeds all the major rivers of Asia. Therefore, it concerns not only Tibet and the Tibetan people, but has serious implications on the food, economic, and water security of a population of about 2 billion people downstream. Uh, if PRC is not made to reverse to change its current policies, Tibet and Tibetans will definitely die a slow death. Mr. Chairman, 
uh, members of the committee, I would like to express appreciation for organizing this very important hearing. These hearings are a boost to the indomitable spirit of the Tibetans inside Tibet and source of inspiration for the Tibetans in exile to continue with our just struggle. I wish to reiterate our gratitude to the U.S. Congress for making necessary changes to the Tibet Policy Act. The continuous support from the Congress, government, and people of the United States will enable the resolution of the Sino-Tibet conflict through the Middle Way policy, which will bring peace to Tibet and beyond. I fervently hope that the bill on promoting a resolution to this Tibet-China Conflict Act introduced in both houses of the U.S. Congress will be made into law. Thank you very much for this opportunity again. I want to thank Sikyon for his very powerful testimony. Uh, and the reason why this hearing, why we've called this hearing, is to begin to act as a pivot. Uh, yes, there's focus on Hong Kong, there's focus on uh, Taiwan, there's focus on what's happening to the Uyghurs and the genocide against the Muslims living there. But we cannot take our eyes off the ongoing genocide being committed uh, against the Tibetan people. And the promoting a resolution to the Tibet-China Conflict Act, uh, authored by my good friend to my left and by, uh, by the ranking member, former chairman um, of the commission, uh, who couldn't make it here today. He had other important things to be at. Um, that becomes the pivot, that we re-engage. And uh, so uh, this testimony and this hearing, uh, and again, that legislation is critical to engaging as never before on Tibet. So I want to uh, yield such time as he may consume uh, to Richard Gere. How's this? We got you now. OK, thanks. Um, I mean, I'm always incredibly moved at these hearings because it's uh, it, it, Congressman Nunn, we haven't met before, but I'm astonished by the power and the profundity and intelligence of uh, your discussion with us today and your experience. So thank you for being part of us. Thank you, Chairman Smith, as always. Senator Merkley, thank you so much for your continued support for these important things. Um, Representative Steele, who spoke, thank you very much. And uh, Under Secretary Ezra Zaya, thank you so much for, for speaking here today. Um, I'm here, uh, my motivation is clear for the Tibetan people, for the Tibetan brothers and sisters that I've known for 45 years, it was 45 years ago that I wandered into a refugee camp in Nepal and was astonished by these extraordinary people. And um, the little that I've been able to help them in the meantime, I think has only to a very small degree repaid what they have given me over the last 45 years. So I'd like to acknowledge our Tibetan brothers and sisters in the room right now. Thank you so much. And then what the, this Tibetan community has been extraordinarily um, successful, as I've seen them all over the world, obviously in India, Nepal, Bhutan, um, other places in Asia, but in Europe and in the U.S. and this wonderful, vibrant Tibetan community in the U.S., many of them citizens, uh, is an extraordinary addition to the American dream and experiment. And um, uh, I, th I think as we've seen... Um, the contribution they've given us is something unique. Um, the commitment to nonviolence, the commitment to wisdom and compassion is something that we sorely need. Um, uh, Chairman Smith, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, First Night, uh, a movie that I made that you referenced when I had very long black hair. <laughs> and I'm going to go back and look at that again myself to remember who I was. For decades, as we know, the Chinese Communist Party's ethnic policies have been largely predicated on containment, denial, destruction, and assimilation. Repression has been most severe in Tibet and in East Turkestan uh, with our Uyghur friends. 
that should be noted as well, where the CCP policies have included the separation of families, the prohibition of language, the destruction of religious sites and institutions, the collection of DNA, and a pervasive surveillance system through which the denial of information of movement is implemented. I think we, we well know now that the surveillance budget in China exceeds their military budget. I obviously do not have to explain this threat uh, to the Tibetan people's very existence to this committee who likely knows decades of atrocities behind CCP's ethnic policies much better than I do and have spoken so eloquently about them today. Thank you. But briefly, in service of Beijing's long-standing agenda to sinicize Tibet and manage, in quotes, individual nationalities, the Chinese Communist Party's policies have been characterized by cruelty, collective violence, and extreme persecution. The saddest truth is that the CCP's process of assimilation and erasure is all too often concealed by Beijing's intricate and powerful propaganda machine. Within China's digital prison, just like all authoritarian regimes, the Chinese government targets the very core attributes that define the continuity of a people specifically the family unit, religious expression, cultural tradition, language, and environment, land. Literally, this was a land grab, a land steal from the Chinese side. Identifiable mechanisms like arbitrary detention, forcible transfer, rape, torture, disappearance are all tools that have been well documented throughout the course of Beijing's assimilation practices. Xi Jinping's recent appointment of Pan Yue to the Central Committee is likely an indication of this aggressive assimilation that will not only continue but surely intensify. And if the Beijing chairman's recent visit to Moscow is any indicator of a new era, every one of China's 55 ethnic groups, including Tibetans, Uyghurs, Mongolians, are right to be extremely afraid. It does not have to be this way. As you know, the Dalai Lama has offered in, in countless ways over many, many decades, since the 1950s, a pathway to resolution built on a dialogue process meant to identify a peaceful and stable resolution in Tibet, which grants Tibetans meaningful autonomy within the framework of the Chinese constitution. I just as a sidebar, when the talks broke down between the Chinese and the Tibetans, um, which I believe was 13 years ago, I think it was about then, 13 years ago, the Tibetan side brought to the discussion the Chinese constitution and their, dis their suggestions for a compromise were based on the Chinese constitution itself. The Chinese walked out and refused to resume discussion. So it's clear where they were coming from. Um, it's obvious why mutual agreement is crucial to Tibet survival and the avoiding of the eradication of the Tibetan people, but it might be much less clear to Beijing, how this benefits them. There are three key elements of this benefit to them. First, it lends Beijing the legitimacy that it so desperately seeks in Tibet and which it's never had. Second, it enables Beijing to reset the relationship with India. And third, if successfully implemented, a reciprocal agreement in Tibet removes or perhaps lessens the international stigma associated with De Beijing's abysmal human rights record, ranging from acts of genocide like those determined by the International Committee of Jurists in 1960 to present-day criticism of Beijing's long-standing brutality in Tibet and East Turkestan, which has only intensified after the 2008 Tibetan uprising, which has been followed by years of self-immolation sacrifices from the Tibetan people in protest of the Chinese government's violent rule. I'd like to ask the committee to remember Tsawang Norbu, a very popular Tibetan singer who self-immolated last year in Lhasa, demonstrating a peaceful agreement in Tibet, which includes the rights of a child, the right to mother tongue, the freedom of movement, and religious practice is a powerful step up for Beijing, sending the entire world the right signal that the Chinese government is genuinely capable of addressing discord through dialogue with reason and a peaceable human value rather than the demonstration of brute force and denial. Two steps must be taken to help this happen. First, we must be clear about the history 
that brought up us to the point of the People's Republic of China and Tibet. Second, the United States allies and the international community must speak with a unified voice. For me, this is the most important thing. The U.S. Congress, the U.S. people have done extraordinary things, but we can only do so much alone. We have to engage our European like-minded partners in a voice, a unified voice against this Chinese oppression. Um, for the record, the Chinese Communist Party invaded Tibet without any provocation whatsoever. And actually, at the suggestion of Stalin at the time, um, in 1949-1950, as the CCP consolidated control over the Tibetan minority nationality, which obviously wasn't a minority of Tibetans, it was all Tibetans. The Chinese had been thrown out of Tibet at that point. The CCP violated human rights standards and contravened its own policy, promises to respect Tibetan institutions, Tibetans' religion, and the Tibetan people's right to self-determination. Open uprising in 1959, March 10th, 1959, in the Dalai Lama's harrowing escape to India, where he and many additional Tibetans sought refuge, and thanks to the generosity of India, remained harbored, where the Tibetan community has become a vibrant and beloved thread in India's plur pluralistic uh, democracy. During the next two decades, the denial and destruction of Tibetan culture, religion, and language, arbitrary detentions and torture, is estimated by the Tibetan government in exile to have resulted in the deaths of 1.2 million Tibetans, one-fifth of the country's population. Many more Tibetans languished in prisons, labor camps, many of them I knew personally. In fact, there was a, an extraordinary Lama, Rebu Rinpoche, who lived with me for the last several years of his life, who had spent 20 years in solitary confinement. Um, many more Tibetans languished in these prisons. Their stories go on and on. Um, historic buildings were destroyed, monastics, temples, 6,000 monasteries destroyed, literally thousands of ancient Buddhist texts critical to the legacy of Tibetan Buddhism and the broader Buddhist community were burned, looted, or lost in the zealotry of the Cultural Revolution. Tibetans were collectivized, leading to unprecedented famine, which was really unheard of before in the CCP, but this also happened to the Chinese people themselves, it should be noted. They sought to thoroughly erase identity or any resistance. Other than specific methodologies, first honed in Tibet, now refined and in well-documented practice with the Uyghurs against the Uyghurs in East Turkestan, not much has changed. But the pattern, however, gives reason for grave concern that it increasingly expands to match the definition of crimes against humanity. Crimes against humanity. Despite being bound to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which they are signatories to, the ICCPR, the Child Rights Convention, and others, Beijing has never demonstrated the standards defined within them in any concrete terms, which makes a mockery of the very vocal claim that China is committed to human rights and the rule of law. Beijing's assault on Tibetan Buddhism has evolved since its invasion of Tibet and in recent years exponentially so under Chairman Xi's rule. CCP policy has transitioned from total destruction of Tibetan religious institutions, gatherings, and practices to one of control, including eliminating core attributes of Tibetan Buddhism while co-opting Tibetan Buddhist rights to determine their own leaders. Tibetans who peacefully oppose this are often detained, routinely tortured, permanently injured, or even killed for the peaceful practice of their religion. Reinforcing that point, the UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights expressed concern about, quote, reports of systematic and massive destruction of religious sites such as mosques, monasteries, shrines, and cemeteries, particularly in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region and the so-called Tibet Autonomous Region, unquote. However, we must draw a line when the Chinese state will re require that Tibetan Buddhist monks receive communist state approval before reincarnating, a demand that's so grossly antithetical to Tibetan Buddhist precepts 
that it cannot be justified by flimsy, falsified historical claims by a communist government professing to be atheist. It's completely ridiculous. The most visible demonstration of, of Beijing's aggressive assertion of authority over selecting the next 15th Dalai Lama must be opposed, and we must not, and we must note as a cautionary tale the first aggression by Beijing during the selection of the 11th Panchen Lama, literally kidnapping the child, had been identified by the Panchen Lama when he was six years old, and then propped up by a state sponsored imposter into the Tibetan uh, reincarnation's empty seat. I remember this moment quite well. I think I was in Dharamsala when this happened. And there was a photograph of this boy, the last photograph that was taken, that's been uh, circulating ever since. The child has not been seen. We don't know if he's alive. His parents, his whole entire family was also kidnapped. They have not been seen since. As we've learned from the Tibetan Action Institute's recent and very valuable research, up to one million Tibetan children are currently and systematically being alienated from the Tibetan language and culture in compulsory boarding schools. The Chinese government's educational policies separate children from their families, forcibly transferring the children into schools far from their parents. Children are taught in Mandarin, as the CCP is keenly aware that mother tongue is a primary mode of cultural transmission. One of the most fundamental components of the continuity of a piece of people's identity from one generation to the next, affecting everything from access to the arts, literature, song, and religious texts. They also note it's one of the last impasses for the control of Tibet and of the Tibetan people. Uprooting native language is particularly egregious in the case of Tibetan culture, considering the role of memorization and recitation plays in the rigorous monastic education system of Tibet. And the CCP's program to sever the transmission of Tibetan language and culture to Tibetan youth proves successful. If it does, it will significantly advance the PRC's agenda to contain and assimilate the entire people. In its concluding observations on the recent third periodic report of China, the UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights expressed concerns of reports, quote, the large-scale campaign to eradicate Tibetan culture and language, as well as the general undermining of the linguistic identity of ethnic minorities by the assimilation policy of the state party, including the coercive residential boarding school system imposed on Tibetan children. Loden's going to be speaking much more about this, aren't you? You're going to hear more details about that. As we argue the risks and f freedom associated with apps like TikTok, the CCP's vicious aim at the future of Tibetan children should send the world a distress signal of the systematic and often secret ruthlessness under which Beijing operates. I hope the committee will also note the forcible population transfer of nomads in Tibet, having thrived for millennia, herding and cultivating the vast and incredibly valuable and sensitive Tibetan plateau and acclaimed to acclimated to Tibet's unique climate. Nomads are proven stewards of the land. Really, no one knows that better than the Tibetans, and especially these nomads. The Chinese have no experience there. Their culture is deeply tied to the environment's demands through a profound belief system that honors landscapes and all living beings. However, the Chinese government systematically expelling nomads from ancestral lands through forced migration transfers them into concentrated sedentary dwellings. Dispossessed of their way of life and ability to make a living, the result is tantamount to the ghettoization of Tibet. According to Chinese state media, at least 1.8 million nomads have been transferred into these sedentary houses under government policies. This estimate is likely extremely conservative, that in uh, 2013, Human Rights Watch reported that over two million Tibetans, two-thirds of the entire population of the TAR, had been rehoused, in quotes, with hundreds of thousands of nomadic herders forced into, quote, new socialist villages. Tibetans are not compensated or guaranteed income or employment when resettled. To the contrary, they're often coerced or forced into work programs that a UN special rapporteur reported, reported may, quote, amount to contemporary forms of slavery. 
including excessive surveillance, abusive living and working conditions, restriction of movement through internment, threats, physical and or sexual violence, and other inhumane or degrading a treatment, treatment, some instances may amount to enslavement as a crime against humanity, meriting a further independent analysis, unquote. CCP surveillance in Tibet is pervasive at all levels of society. Beijing's matrix of technology, which is heavily invested in and finely tuned, monitors the movements, phone calls, and internet habits of every citizen. The most minor offenses can lead to imprisonment, torture, and even death. Information control, internet blackouts, and invasive digital surveillance feeds a massive state of control in Tibet. As we've recently witnessed the emergence of CCP police departments in the shadows of democratic cities throughout the world, it's astonishing. We know the surveillance extends far beyond Tibet's borders. Within China, Chinese tech firms have developed software to detect and track Tibetans and other, quote, ethnic minorities within the PRC. A report published by the Citizens Lab finds that China's policy in the Tibetan autonomous region has gathered between 920,000 to 1.2 million DNA samples in the Tibetan autonomous region over the last six years. These figures represent a quarter to a third of the total population of the TAR. Human Rights Watch also details Chinese authorities systematically collecting DNA from residents of the TAR, including blood from children as young as five years old without parental consent. Can I imagine this with your own children? With our own children, our grandchildren, unthinkable. It should remind us of the East German Stasi methods, which uh, horrified us all. Families were encouraged to spy, report on each other, often through coercive or financial incentives. I hope the committee will note the dangerous pattern of death due to torture that has been observed, including the recent deaths of 19-year-old monk Tenzin Nima and 51-year-old tour guide Kunchak Jimpa. In both cases, as with many others, an investigation into deaths in custody and the prosecution of those responsible to them for those deaths was never undertaken by the Chinese authorities. I'd also like to note for the record Jigme Gyatso, a monk at Lebrang Monastery who recorded and released a video detailing his torture at the hands of Chinese police. He was sentenced to five years in prison for that video, released in extremely poor condition, and as a result of his crime, Jigme was blacklisted from receiving private medical care until his death last summer. The appropriation of land often coincides with the persecution of a people. China's annexation of Tibet, the land grab, and Beijing's plunder of Tibet's abundant natural resources have significant regional security implications as well. One of the most illustrative examples is water. China is water poor. In contrast, the Tibetan Plateau is the source of the entire region's major rivers, at least 1.5 billion people rely on for food and economic development. The PRC has erected numerous massive damming projects and continues with extensive plans for water diversion. China's occupation of Tibet provides necessary resources to China while allowing Beijing to control the tap for South and Southeast Asia. This is a very, very important factor. This is security for the entire world that we're playing with here. Precious metals and, and minerals serve as another example. Tibet's occupation provides access to 126 different minerals, including copper, iron, uranium, zinc, gold, and lead. Tibet has also large amounts of lithium, and that's critical to powering modern technologies like cell phones, and hybrid and electric cars. Tibet's location and scale also provide a commanding position for the entire Himalayan region, a fact certainly not lost on the Communist Party. We've witnessed deadly skirmishes between the Chinese and the Indians in Arunachal Pradesh, where the People's Liberation Army encroaches on Indian borders and continues to antagonize stability in the region. Resource exploitation, environmental appropriation of the plateau overlay, a thick blanket of repression over Tibetans who call it home. Voicing or communicating concern over these policies puts Tibetan lives at risk of a 
detainment, disappearance, or worse. And so fear permeates the plateau, leaving Tibetans silenced. This is how Tibetan people survive in occupied Tibet, in fear and silence. According to international law, people deserve the right to determine their own future. The Tibetan people's call for dialogue with the People's Republic of China is an urgent cry for self-determination to protect Tibet's unique culture, religion, linguistic, and environmental heritage. This cry has been going on now for decades. While self-determination does not carry a single definition, the Tibetan people have proposed a way forward toward self-determination and meaningful autonomy within the framework of the Chinese constitution in a reciprocal proposal of compromise based on protecting the core interests of both Tibet and China. His Holiness the Dalai Lama has presented multiple documents over these many decades that provide a concrete framework for negotiation, yet in contrast, Beijing refuses to return to the tables. Thirteen years have passed since the last Sino-Tibetan dialogue, although the U.S. Return, return routinely calls for the resumption of dialogue. In fact, it's by law of the land now that it has to be called for. The Tibet Policy Act of 2002 requires that a resumption of dialogue and has made multiple laws stating support for dialogue, the CCP ignores it and any like-minded nations calling for that same dialogue. Such a strategy must be called out. China must return to the negotiating table at the highest level immediately. And these are the policy recommendations going forward to pass H.R. 533S, 138, which has been discussed, very, very important piece of legislation, and work with the administration to clarify U.S. support of the Tibetan people and negotiations with the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan leadership. This is essential, completely essential to long-term support of Tibetans' call for self-determination. Number two, the implementation of the Tibetan Policy and Support Act and the Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act. These were really important things that passed congressmen over the last years, uh, uh, both houses. Um, and, and we have to make sure that they are implemented and we have followed through from, from all of us to go to the State Department, State Department and say, what have you done? We need the report. By law, this is something you have to do. And they need that encouragement. Follow the UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights uh, in its concluding observations. They call on Chinese authorities to immediately abolish the colonial boarding school system imposed on Tibetan children, allow private Tibetan schools to be established, and ensure Tibetan is a language of instruction in Tibet. Also include and utilize the U.S. vote in the UN and optimize like-minded to pre of countries we're talking about, to press central committee members to halt the expulsion of nomadic herders, rural, rural residents, and small-scale farmers from ancestral lands. Also publish a comprehensive report on CCP's propaganda efforts in China and in international forums to manipulate global perceptions of Tibet, Tibetan Buddhism and His Holiness the Dalai Lama, the, the Chinese version of history, is a complete fantasy. And the decades of that fantasy is not going to change the reality or the truth of it. It's very important for us as, as free-speaking peoples to tell the truth about the history, and the history is clear for anyone to see. Monitor CCP's digital transitional uh, transnational oppression, international police presence, and evaluate the rights uh, violations both in China and in other countries. And finally, implement concrete restrictions for technology transfer and U.S. company support for forced or coerced DNA and medical data collection. I really want to thank the committee and everyone here for this very long testimony. <laughs> Everyone here knows this already, but maybe someone else listening to this hearing or reading it will hear it for the first time. And just, uh, it's an overview that I think my partners to my left are going into more detail. So thank you all very much. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Gear. thank you for that <laughs> tremendous testimony. It is 
comprehensive, informative, motivating, uh, and it gives us so much to act upon. And the historical perspective as well uh, is just extraordinary. Thank you so very much. Ms. Tatho. Chair Smith, Co-Chair Merkley, and other distinguished members of the Commission, thank you for your steadfast and groundbreaking leadership on the Tibetan issue. Thank you for this honor to be able to speak here today. I just want to start um, by speaking, making it clear that I am speaking of Tibet as Tibetans know it. The entire Tibetan plateau, 900,000 square miles, made up of three historical provinces of Utsang, Kham, and Amdo. And with a total Tibetan population of what is today around 7 million Tibetans. China misleadingly claims that there are only 3.2 million Tibetans in Tibet because they count only the Tibetans in the Tibet Autonomous Region. That is central and western Tibet, mostly. They've taken all of Eastern Tibet and they've carved up and sub-fragmented Tibetans and the lands that they live on into four Chinese provinces and 12 autonomous count, uh, prefectures and counties. And in this way, they distort and confuse people about what is the true picture inside of Tibet. For 70 years, generation after generation of Chinese leaders have tried to break the faith and the loyalty of the fiercely independent Tibetan people to His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama, to Buddhism, and to a distinct Tibetan identity that existed for well over a thousand years before the People's Republic of China was even founded. But after using countless strategies, resources, and unimaginable violence, Xi Jinping now believes the best way for China to conquer Tibet is to kill the Tibetan in the child. He's doing this by taking nearly all Tibetan children away from their families and from the people who will surely transmit this identity to them, not just their parents, but their spiritual leaders and their teachers. And he's handing them over to agents of the Chinese state to raise them to speak a new language practice a new culture and religion, that of the Chinese Communist Party. A little over a year ago, of a, a little over a year ago, Tibet Action released a report showing that at least 800,000 Tibetan children are now living in a massive network of boarding primary, middle, and secondary schools across all of historical Tibet. This shockingly high number means that at least three out of every four Tibetan children in all of historical Tibet from ages 6 to 18 are now separated from their families and living in a state-run colonial boarding school system where the medium of instruction and the entire curriculum is focused on fostering loyalty to China. Tibetan is taught as a single language class, if at all, and Tibetan culture is most often reduced to nothing more than dance and song and tokenized wearing of traditional Tibetan clothing. The practice of Tibetan Buddhism is, of course, strictly prohibited. China doesn't hide the fact that these schools exist. There's plenty of online propaganda claiming the students in the boarding schools are happy and receiving a modern education. This propaganda nearly always features very prominently that single Tibetan language class. But what it hides and what is not included in our report is the existence of boarding preschools. Though we were hearing reports from Tibet that parents were being forced to send children as young as four and five away, we could not find any details on where they were being sent or what schooling they were receiving. It was only on the eve of actually releasing our report that we met an expert eyewitness who'd recently fled from Tibet and who confirmed the existence of the mandatory boarding preschools for children living in rural areas of Tibet. Dr. Gello, a Tibetan academic who holds a PhD from the University of Toronto and has over 30 years of experience in the field of education in Tibet and China, estimates that an additional 100 to 150,000 Tibetan children at least ages four to six years old now live in these boarding schools. He's visited more than 50 himself. He's seen the children are required to live there Monday to Friday where they're immersed in a completely Chinese learning environment, including participating in war reenactments where they're dressed in PLA uniforms or red army suits. 
One Tibetan teacher describes the situation in her area like this. Usually there are very few Tibetan teachers. The majority are Chinese. So teachers only speak in Mandarin and conduct all school curriculum in Mandarin, including nursery rhymes and bedtime stories. When the children join primary school, hardly any of them can speak Tibetan. Dr. Gallo witnessed the impacts of these preschools in his own family when, just after three months of being in one, children in his family who'd grown up in an entirely Tibetan-speaking household preferred to speak in Chinese. He saw them growing emotionally distant from their parents and grandparents and acting like, as he says, guests or strangers in their own home. Imagine your loved ones at this age and try to imagine the heartbreak that this is causing for these families. I have a six-year-old and three-year-old twins, so I'm right now fully immersed in this period of childhood development. Kids at this stage need the care of their parents and their families to help them eat, bathe, get dressed, and maybe even more importantly, to scare away the monsters at night, to comfort them when they're sick or hurt, and to reassure them that everything is gonna be okay. Tibetan parents don't want to send their kids away, and most wouldn't if they had a choice. (laughs) Some parents refuse, and many more want to, but China's repression makes the price of resistance extremely high. In order to avoid sending kids away, some families families split up, sending one parent to live with the child in an urban area where they can attend a day school, and other parents report sleeping in cars near the boarding preschools just so that they can be close to the kids at all times. And of course, the children are suffering too. Research by scholars in China and Tibet clearly shows that the removal of Tibetan children from their homes, as well as the highly regimented and isolating boarding school life, is traumatizing Tibetan children. First-hand accounts of Tibetans who attended boarding schools in Tibet show that pervasive racism and discrimination will inevitably lead them to develop feelings of shame and ethnic inferiority. These impacts in Tibet sound hauntingly similar to the residential boarding school system used to eliminate indigenous identities in Canada, the US, Australia, and beyond. This is because Chinese leaders are pursuing the same strategy for the same reasons in Tibet, East Turkestan, and Southern Mongolia, to quell resistance and to consolidate China's rule over foreign lands and peoples. And while Chinese officials argue that the schools in Tibet are fundamentally different from boarding schools of the colonial era, in part because students get to attend schools with modern facilities, they miss the point entirely that what matters is what Tibetans want for their children. And Dr. Gello likes to simplify this issue in another way by saying it's not about how good the school facilities are, but what is happening inside The fundamental question is who is teaching what to whom? And in Tibet, the answer is clear. The Chinese state is removing Tibetan children from their homes by force or coercion and placing them in schools where they have to speak Chinese to conform to Chinese culture and tradition while stripping them of their own identity, including their religion and their mother tongue. If this is not colonial education, I don't know what is. And when viewed together with the all-out attack on Buddhism and the nomadic way of life, we can see China intends to destroy everything that makes Tibetans Tibetan. And calling it ethnic unity or ethnic fusion or assimilation or sinicization doesn't make it different or any less colonial than what was done by Canada and the US and Australia to First Nations, Indigenous and Aboriginal people. And what it is, is crystal clear to Tibetans, just as it's crystal clear to Uyghurs and Southern Mongolians. China's committing genocide in Tibet. And at a time when our nations are finally reckoning with these atrocities, that Xi Jinping is pursuing a strategy targeting children for the elimination of language and culture, a colonial strategy now reviled and condemned around the world, should be, along with the Uyghur genocide, a massive red flag for the international community of the true nature and intention of the Chinese Communist Party. But this doesn't have to be the end of the story. Tibetans inside Tibet have not stopped fighting. We hear the stories of their resistance every single day. And our Uyghur, Southern Mongolian, Hong Kong, and Chinese activist brothers and sisters are fighting too. Now is the critical time for the world to step up and help. And I'll end there and um, address my recommendations in the Q&A. Thank you.
Thank you for those very powerful insights and the warnings as what as to what Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party is doing to the children. Um, and I look forward to offering or proposing some questions uh, to delve even further into that. So thank you so very much. I'd like to now uh, recognize uh, Mr. Dorji. Thank you so much, Chairman Smith. Thank you, Co-Chair Merkley. And I want to thank all the CECC staff for organizing this important hearing on Tibet. Um, it's a great honor to speak here um, next to my colleagues, uh, and especially speaking alongside the democratically elected Prime Minister of Tibet in exile, uh, Sikyong Uh It's also very inspiring to be here in this room today uh, with some of the most active members of the Tibet movement who are right here in this room, especially one of the most inspiring uh, heroes of the Tibet movement, a former political prisoner, Ngawa Sandula. I just saw her sitting over there. <clears throat> Ngawa, Ngawa Sandula started fighting for Tibet when she was 12 or 13 years old and went to Chinese prison for simply participating in a nonviolent protest. Uh, today, she's still out here fighting for the same cause. Oppression produces exile. All oppressed nations have a blessing called diaspora, where stateless exiles are able to enjoy freedom of expression, religion, assembly, and association that they are denied back home. Once upon a time, Tibetans in the diaspora also enjoyed these freedoms. But in the last decade, many of these freedoms have succumbed to the long arm of the Chinese government, from Nepal and India to Sweden and Switzerland. And now, even in Canada and the United States, formal and informal agents of the Chinese government are using some of the oldest tactics of manipulation and some of the newest technologies of repression to bully threaten, harass, and intimidate Tibetans into silence. To fully grasp why and how China's apparatus of transnational repression targets Tibetans, we must understand its origins. China has historically viewed the Tibetan diaspora as a leading threat to its global reputation. In the 90s, the international Tibet movement was quite successful at exposing China's human rights violations and generating bad PR for the regime. This was undermining Beijing's foreign policy objectives. It was during this period that the Chinese government launched a new campaign to clean up its global image. But instead of improving its human rights record on the ground, Beijing decided to go after the Tibet movement abroad. China proceeded to develop a sophisticated set of tools, tactics, and strategies to silence not only Tibetans, but also pro-Tibet voices in the international scene. This multi-year project to dislodge Tibet from the global agenda and erase it from public consciousness targets students, activists, artists, academics, former political prisoners, and many elite institutions. Some of my own friends and colleagues in Canada and the United States have gone through traumatizing experiences as a result of being targeted either directly by Beijing or by online mobs of Chinese nationalists who are often acting at the behest of the Chinese consulate. One strategy that Beijing employs with devastating effectiveness is the relationship mapping that links individuals in the diaspora to their families in Tibet. This mapping of family connections allows Chinese authorities to use the fate of relatives back home in Tibet as a pawn to blackmail exiled Tibetans into silence. Two years ago, I interviewed a Tibetan American in New York who had visited Tibet to see her aging parents. She told me how, toward the end of her trip, her minders from the United Front explicitly told her that her political behavior going forward would determine not only her future chances of getting a visa, but also the safety and well-being of her families in Tibet. Her parents are basically the hostage, and her silence in exile is the ransom. It's a ransom she must pay every day 
by refraining from actions, online or offline, that may be perceived as critical of China. Agents of the United Front or the Chinese consulate unfailingly communicate this exact message to every Tibetan American who visits Tibet or applies for a visa. Most of the time, they don't get the visa. This transnational family mapping is designed to manufacture a sense of guilt, let's call it advanced guilt, in the conscience of the exile, making the exile feel that her political participation will endanger her family in Tibet. The ultimate goal of this coercion by proxy is the political deactivation of the exile. Another common Chinese strategy is the weaponization of funding to depoliticize institutions and demobilize communities. This mechanism is visible in the case of Pema Taje, the self-identified Tibetan NYPD officer who was spying for the Chinese government. Exploiting the power of his NYPD uniform, he was trying to manipulate the leaders of the New York Tibetan community. This is what he was saying to them, and I quote. He was saying to the Tibetan leaders, you guys are paying a monthly mortgage of nearly $50,000 for your community center. I have some very wealthy Chinese friends who can help subsidize your mortgage, but you should stop <laughs> flying the Tibetan flag at your events, and you should ban any discussion of political issues at this venue." Unquote. By dangling the promise of funding before the community leaders, Pema Taji was trying to depoliticize and co-opt one of the most important Tibetan-owned spaces in the diaspora. Beyond targeting Tibetan communities, Beijing has used its control, tight control over access and funding to shape political discourse on university campuses, in cultural institutions, academic forums, and even influence the research agenda of budding scholars and aspiring Sinologists. Beijing's apologists out here happily exploit the openness of our democratic systems to defend, ironically defend, the world's largest dictatorship. Nevertheless, I believe there are ways to fight this. The US and the West in general has conceded so much ground to China in the last three decades and moved the equilibrium so far in Beijing's favor it is time to reset the diplomatic baseline, and it's time to go back to first principles of historical truth of Tibetan independence and legal right of the Tibetan people to self-determination. It is time to liberate ourselves from the delusion that sweeping human rights under the rug or throwing Tibetans and Uyghurs to the wolves would somehow make China more likely to cooperate on issues of common interest or geopolitical importance. The best way to counter China's transnational repression is to proactively support the Tibetan, Uyghur, and Hong Kong people's transnational decolonial advocacy for human rights and self-determination, and strengthen the Chinese people's long-standing struggle for democracy and freedom. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very, very much, all of you, for that tremendous uh, uh, testimony. This has to be a pivot. Uh, I think uh, your point, uh, you know, we have unfortunately bought into a narrative from Xi Jinping and Hu Jintao and all the others that preceded him uh, that somehow if you go along, you get along, you do more trade and things matriculate from dictatorship to democracy. Nothing like that has happened. So it's time to pivot. And certainly Tibet policy is a place that is, that is just crying out uh, for a reappraisal and for a new... A, a new initiative on the part of the U.S. government, which is why S-138 and H.R. 533 are so important in that endeavor. Let me just, a couple of questions, and I'll yield to, to the co-chair uh, for uh, his questions. Uh, on the boarding schools, um, if you could, you know, my first human rights trip, I've been to China many times on human rights trips. I never got into Lhasa. Frank Wolf, my colleague, did. I didn't. Couldn't get in. Uh, but my first trip was actually to Moscow and Leningrad. And in 1982, on behalf of Soviet Jews. And I'll never forget being in what was then, uh, what is now St. Petersburg, uh, going to a museum on atheism and began to learn that the communist ideology, it either destroys or co-ops 
all faiths and all exercises of of conscience. Uh, and they, you know, right now Xi Jinping is using uh, his synodization campaign uh, to completely co-opt all faiths uh, and all belief systems or destroy them. Uh, and and um, my, we went to this museum on atheism and while we were there, um, they were mocking Christianity, Judaism, and Islam uh, in, in Kazan Cathedral, which had been turned into a museum on atheism. While we were there, all these young, young pioneers, children that were 11, 8, 10, were going by with guides, pointing to all of the faith uh, symbols and mocking them because we got a translation from our uh, people that were taking us through it, from the embassy, mocking them like I couldn't believe. And all the children were laughing. Uh, look at this. Look at that. How crazy. Da, 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 da. Uh, and, and, you know, as they were teaching a militant atheism uh, in the schools. And I'm wondering if you could shed some light on what the consequence of, of these boarding schools is on the hearts and minds of these children, how long have those schools been in effect uh, you know, as, as, a, as a tool of repression by the Chinese Communist Party? Do they mock the Dalai Lama uh, there? Uh, we know that on the internet, if you put the Dalai Lama into, and, and I did it at a, at a Beijing um, 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 uh, internet cafe uh, and didn't get anything but negatives, uh, unbelievably harsh negatives. And Google was all a part of it. I was on a Google website or, or, or search engine in Beijing, and that's the garbage that I got from uh, the censors from the Chinese Communist Party. And I'm wondering, once they get a child with a very impressionable, malleable mind, uh, what is the impact when they're trashing uh, and mocking the Dalai Lama, Buddhism. Uh, do we know how it's affecting the children? Uh, are they turning against, uh, I mean, how do they resist? And, and, and do they have contact with their parents um, while they're at the boarding school? Do they, you know, what is the modus operandi there? Do they come home for summer vacation? Or, or you know, I use that in, a, in a, an American context, but do they get time off to see their parents? Um, because again, it's just, uh, secondly, if I could, on the population transfer issue, which uh, uh, Mr. Geary used, pointed out, uh, I read one of the Dalai Lama's books, and I remember he had a whole section about population transfer as it was happening. And it's only gotten worse as, obviously, Tibetans, indigenous Tibetans, are, are increasingly displaced. They also have used the forced abortion, coercive population control program very effectively as a tool of... of, uh, of uh, uh, genocide. Uh, we know that, and I'm wondering if you might want to speak to the transfer issue. Uh, and, and finally, um, uh, the whole issue of, and you mentioned it, Mr. Uh, Dorji, about the um, dislodging from the international uh, agenda. Uh, uh, you know, there are too many people who just care about the trade so much and about getting along with the Chinese diplomats who are very smooth, uh, except when they are not uh, in international fora. I've seen them at the UN. I've seen them at the Human Rights Council in Geneva. Uh, and they're bullies. Uh, if they don't get their way. I went to a, a press conference that was being held by the Chinese delegation at the UN Human Rights, and I asked questions. And they closed down the press conference when I got into several human rights issues. They're all miffed. Before that, they were all talking in superlatives about how great the Chinese human rights record is, which it is not, of course. So again, these pieces of legislation uh, and the prioritization of this by uh, our Secretary of State, our Ambassador to the United Nations, and others, uh, we need to do more to get to bet further on the agenda. Yes, we have terrible issues with the Uyghurs. We have Hong Kong, Taiwan, all the other terrible, terrible issues. But it can't be at the expense of Tibet. It's got to be reasserted front and center. Uh, maybe you could give us some insights as to how. Thank you for those questions. Um, Briefly, so restricted access, Tibet is so restricted, so severely restricted, it is nearly impossible to know the exact situation and conditions, not just in the schools, but what it is like when the kids go home because um, people are just, the climate of fear is so incredible. Uh, there's really uh, not many people who will talk or will give us the kind of rich information and eyewitness accounts we used to get when thousands of Tibetans escaped from Tibet every year into India and Nepal. That number, Human Rights Watch, had it at about 3,000 average a year until, until 2008. Now that number is 
a dozen maybe make it, less. even less. Yeah, way less. I mean, it's it's um, unbelievable. So we've lost, unfortunately, those rich accounts of what the policy impacts of the Chinese government are inside Tibet. What we do know, though, so the boarding preschools have only been around since, say, 2016. So those little ones, we, we really don't know how um, how the detail of how they're affected by the political indoctrination, we can only assume the worst. The older students in this current sort of system of boarding schools, it's been about a decade or so um, that, that, that they've been being built and really expanded. And we've heard stories, reports of Tibetan students protesting the removal of Tibetan language in those schools, um, other things like that, that that let us know that of course these kids are still Tibetan and their allegiance to His Holiness and to Buddhism will be so deeply ingrained in them that it's unlikely they're participating at that level now. But if this goes on for generations, what does our future what does our future look like? Exactly. And then as far as how often kids can go home, again, not very often. Um, the preschools seem to allow kids to go home on the weekends, but uh, certainly for the boarding schools that are hundreds and hundreds of miles away, the kids can go home supposedly every few months, some it's even longer, and many parents can't afford to go get them. So kids will go not home, but to a nearby <laughs> connection or family member, or even have to stay in the school rather than see the kids. Mean, could I just ask you, do they... If a parent challenges the child, um, do they report on them and then they're disciplined or arrested um, when if the child goes back to the school and, or the, the boarding school and they say, mom and dad said this? Um, what happens then? Oh, yeah, I would assume. I mean, the, the, you mean if the parents say anything to the child that the child then reports yes. later? Yeah, absolutely. And that's been the way of uh, Chinese authorities in Tibet for, for decades. If I may yes. add... <clears throat> something very quickly to that. Uh, just quickly on, yeah, what Laden was uh, mentioning about the relationship between <clears throat> the children and their parents is already becoming very, very uh, weak and in the process of being cut right now. Uh, children being unable or struggling to converse with their parents is very much happening. We have heard several accounts um, and testimonials of this process undergoing right now. One thing that has already happened to so many families is the relationship between children and their grandparents. Because many Tibetan parents speak Tibetan as their first language, but they are able to speak some rudimentary Chinese as a second language in some places. Whereas when it comes to the older generation of Tibetans who are above 50 or 60, the grandparents' generation, they don't speak any Chinese because there was not a single Chinese in Tibet before 1959 or 1949 during the invasion years. And that generation of Tibetans do not speak any Chinese at all, and they still don't, which means many of these children who are in the boarding preschools, they are coming back home when they are able to come uh, during, you know, during their short breaks in between, and they're not able to say anything, have any kind of communication. Forget about conversing with their grandparents. They're not able to have any communication with their grandparents. So the grandparents have already lost the children. And this, one thing I want to highlight here is the role, sometimes because you know, our societies, you know, the, the structure of our societies are so different that we forget the role that grandparents can play in the development of children their psychology, their worldview, their cultural characters. And in Tibetan society, like many traditional societies, grandparents play an extremely foundational role in the development of the children's worldview, psychology, and their fundamental identity. And that's part of the reason why this is particularly dangerous, what's already happening. Uh, one quick thing I want to add also about you know, the second question, uh, China being a bully in so many different uh, scenarios and different <clears throat> arenas. As we all know, this is, uh, you know, nobody likes a bully, but there's nothing worse than a bully who also plays the victim. And the Chinese government has been extremely good at that. They play the victim everywhere, but what they are actually doing, their real character is that of a bully. And they do this inside Tibet, 
in East Turkestan, they do it to their own Chinese people who are asking for democracy, and they also do this abroad. And one way in which all of these issues, whether it's the Uyghur genocide, whether it's the uh, dismantling of democracy in Hong Kong, or whether it's the colonial boarding schools in Tibet, one way that will help us actually be more effective in fighting each of these issues is actually seeing them as a collective whole. Because the, what the Chinese government is trying to do is isolate each of these issues and get the world to see them as separate issues so that our list keeps increasing because China's crimes are increasing, right? There are so many. So we get overwhelmed by just the length of the list, whereas I think if we are able to see all of these issues as part of the same root problem of the Chinese Communist Party, which has no legitimacy to rule over a quarter of the world's population, I think that framework will actually help us uh, find, visualize a roadmap much more easily to dealing with that. No, we, I was just asking if we had any any uh, clear numbers of the number of um, Chinese who have come into Tibetan territory. So we don't, we don't have them. But I would assume at this point, I mean, a lot of the work that we did at ICT was to stop the population transfer. And population transfer in the Geneva Convention is considered a genocide. Um, we... We, I think we can make the assumption that there are more Chinese than Tibetans in Tibetan regions at this point. So let's, let's say that there are seven, eight million Chinese that have, are now residents and controlling uh, the Tibetan plateau. Um, I, I, we're, I, I think as, as you were saying, we get overwhelmed by how vast this Chinese machine is. And, you know, we have to rethink in the West every couple of years what our policies are. And there's an interim period where, where there's discussion and there's, there's a relaxation of movement. There's no relaxation in China. These policies were set many, many decades ago. And this 100-year program for the Chinese to take over the world, they're 50 years ahead at this point because they're on point of knowing exactly what they set out to do. Um, the mechanisms that they have in place uh, are, are everywhere now. They're in our universities. They're in our schools. They're in our police departments. They're in our, you know, the, 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 the deep structures of our intelligence community. They're everywhere. Um, and we have to look at this. But as, as the gentleman said, we can't get overwhelmed by how big it is. We have to be able to parse it piece by piece and look at it. And the, the things that mean most to us are our children, frankly. And to look at that the, the deepest, I think, and this question of continuity of culture from grandmother, grandfather to child is deeply important for us. Can we imagine our own kids being devoid of that kind of cultural continuity and transfer of, of, of thoughts and emotions and, and a sense of who we are in the universe. Uh, the Tibetan culture was an experiment of extraordinary visionary possibilities. When Buddhism came to Tibet in the 7th, 8th century, it, they were tough guys in the community. Tibet at one point controlled all of Asia. They controlled the Mongolians, the, 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 the Chinese, which is, there wasn't even the Han Chinese at that point. The Han Chinese were a very small, insignificant kingdom uh, that long ago. Uh, but Tibet was transformed by Buddhism. They took it seriously. And the institutions were not institutions of, of generating money or power in a worldly sense, but creating bodhisattvas perfect human beings who actually generated love and compassion and wisdom. And the institutions of the, the, uh, the convents, the nuns, the, the, uh, the monasteries were supported by the people. And that's where they sent their kids gladly there to be educated and to foster these incredible ideals, which is, I grew up in a Christian household, compassion, love, 
you know, care for our neighbors. These were important things to us that we had to learn from our parents and our culture. The Tibetans learned it in the extreme, that this was a life and death struggle between the right path and the wrong path. And the path they chose was love and compassion in all levels of society. Chinese disrupted that completely in 1949 with this invasion. And, and um, it was a very unfortunate but necessary thing for the Dalai Lama to leave. Um, when I w first became interested in the Tibetans, and I had knew very little about the political situation, I was going to go to, to Tibet. And I had a friend of mine, who, John Avedon, who had just written a book about uh, the history of Tibet and also the diaspora. And he said, why are you going to Tibet? And I said, well, I want to see Tibet. And I said, well, you, you'll just see Chinese there. And you see people who are so coward and fearful. You won't really have an experience there. Go to Dharamsala. See His Holiness there. So I did. And that was really the beginning of my involvement. But it was so stunning to me to see Tibetans living in exile, but within their own communities with this continuity of culture were unique. And I see it to that community that's sitting here with us today. These people are unique. They're unique on the planet. They're unique in our present society. They have so much to offer us, not just Americans, but the entire planet, of how we can proceed. This, this breaking of that continuity of love and compassion and wisdom is, is probably the, the saddest thing that we've seen. I don't care about the money. I don't even care about the natural resources. I care about this continuity of love and compassion. And that's what we've seen broken. You know, I read John Evadon's uh, op-eds years past, decades ago. One of them was called The Rape of Tibet. And he talked about how forced abortion was used with absolute impunity against the Tibetan women just to get rid of Tibetans. I mean, it was outrageous. So, oh, to be fair, they used it against their own people. Of course they do. Of course they do. No, so this, is, this discussion but it was is not against the Chinese people, right. but against a system which is destroying them as well as us. Thank you so much. Uh, Chairman Merkley. I so much appreciate the testimony that each of you have, have brought and the experiences that all of you who are attending are, are bringing to bear in this, in this effort. Uh, there's a vote underway in the Senate, so I have a question for each of you. Um, but probably, if I'm going to make the vote, which I need to, I'll, I'll ask that maybe take two minutes to respond to each question. I wanted to start, Ms. Tetong, um, noting that in November, on behalf of this executive commission, uh, then uh, Chair McGovern and I sent a letter uh, to the UN, seeking a UN investigation on the separation of Tibetan children from their families to these colonial boarding schools. Uh, on March 6th, uh, there was a report that the UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights did do a study. Uh, did not come from the High Commission on Human Rights, but, but the, from the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And it very much called for an end to the forced relocations and the state-run uh, boarding schools and had a, a quite a lot of data. So one section of the UN has, has pursued an investigation. The question now is, how can we take and push the UN to the next step? What's the most important next step that this uh, Congressional Executive Commission should push for? Thank you for the question, and thank you also for your efforts. Uh, in moving this issue, changing this issue, uh, especially at the UN. I think if the uh, members of the commission could request the administration, uh, members of the commission, um, members of Congress, uh, could request the administration to really lead a coalition of like-minded countries in opposing colonial boarding schools at the United Nations, at the Human Rights Council and other international fora, I think that would play a huge part, um, have, make such a contribution to First, getting this issue out there because it's been hiding, or the Chinese government has been hiding it so effectively. And second, for pushing um, other countries, to get, giving other countries the support they need to get on board. And I think there are a lot of, of uh, like-minded nations who have these histories of the um, residential boarding schools and these kind of policies that really have an obligation to lead together with the US, like Canada, like Australia, um, and others. Yes. Uh, th uh, thank you. 
and uh, and certainly this is uh, an agenda that we can continue to push for. I look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, in that regard. And uh, Mr. Gare, you talked in your testimony, kind of following on that, how we need a unified voice with our European partners. How can we best, best amplify the, these horrific circumstances, which, as I was saying to uh, uh, Chairman Smith uh, during the testimony, if you're just hearing the story and you weren't already familiar with it, it would sound like a um, dystopian world, uh, you know, a few centuries fr from now on some other planet, you know, in some sci-fi novel. All of these horrific circumstances that are, are going on. But it's here. It's now. We do know it. Uh, we hear it again. <clears throat> and um, the world becomes somewhat hardened to all of the circumstances uh, that uh, are going to awry. Uh, how do we build a stronger, unified voice with our European partners? Well, I think there's a moment now. I mean, there's a high skepticism of China right now. And I think we have to take advantage of that. The Chinese have been very um, successful in promising separate deals with different countries. Um, there's, there hasn't been a unified effort against China. But I think there is a moment now that there's a, a, a high degree of of uh, unhappiness and skepticism and a feeling of danger and fear of, of China at this moment, which is pretty universal, uh, and certainly with our European partners. Uh, um, I think this is the moment for the State Department, for the Commission, for, for us, for all of us, you know, to make those connections wherever we can. Um, uh, Mr. McGovern and I have talked about this quite a bit, and, and uh, and uh, Congresswoman Speaker Pelosi also. This is, to me, is, is central to what we can do to actually change things. The, the, US, the U.S. Congress, the U.S. government, the U.S. people have been completely supportive of, of the Tibetan cause. And, there's, uh, and we continue to be very strong in what we're doing. These bills are very important, very powerful bills that are getting, winding their way through Congress and have been achieved. The Tibet Support Act of 2002 is huge in, in mm -hmm. declaring support for the Tibetan people and, and correcting uh, uh, many of the misperceptions uh, through the propaganda of the Chinese government. Now's the time to talk to our, our, um, our equals in Europe to our friends in Europe and say, look, this is the legislation that we have started with. And it's taken us decades to get here. But use us what we have done to get similar laws passed, similar legislation done in, in UK and France and Italy. I was on the phone with the Italians today. We're going to be presenting many of these same legislations in Italy because there's a government there today that is incredibly skeptical of what the Chinese are doing in the world. So this is a moment to take it and take chances of reaching out to our friends around the world. Uh, thank you, Mr. Guerin. And, and I know this comes from your heart and from decades of, of advocacy. And um, we need more uh, American citizens uh, to join you as we are joining you in this advocacy. Um, it's just a uh, tremendous effort, and let's seize this moment as you have suggested. And Mr. Dorji, uh, you talk about the, the long arm of Chinese government and how they are essentially blackmailing Tibetans who are resident in the United States. Citizens. Tet Tibetans who are citizens here in the United States. And this is a, a practice they're employing not just with regard to Tibet, but uh, uh, in kind of a broad scope of trying to suppress the freedom of speech here, both by, by threats regarding that person, but also even perhaps more effectively threats against their families back home. And you gave us a very uh, specific uh, e example, the name deleted to protect the, uh, the individual. But uh, it is extraordinarily hard to be an, an advocate when your family is, is being threatened. 
Uh, what is the single most effective thing we can do to counter uh, this type of blackmail against uh, Tibetan citizens and Tibetan residents, citizens of the United States, residents here, uh, when their families are threatened back home? Thank you so much. <clears throat> Uh, I remember about 15, 20 years ago, America was a very different place where there would be Chinese students studying overseas. Uh, there were all sorts of students here who were participating in political conversations. Um, when I was an undergrad, actually, on my campus, I've seen Chinese students even taking part in all the events going to debates, they would come to Tibet events, they would come to uh, other political events without fear that, they, that somebody is watching over their shoulder. Things have changed a lot. And right now, I sometimes I work as a, a teaching assistant at Columbia University. And what I see on campus, and many campuses these days is very different. I've spoken to a lot of Chinese students, let alone Tibetan students and Uyghur students um, and Hong Kong students. Even Chinese students who, used, who actually have less reason to fear the Chinese government, even they are terrified of taking part in any kind of activity that might be deemed as remotely critical or even borderline uh, critical to the Chinese government. And I think if we can find a way to make the universities a little bit more responsible to their students, it's the job of the universities to protect their students, the free speech of the students, the First Amendment rights of the students, to take part in events they like to go to, to participate in protests, to uh, take part in dialogue, to actually even meet with Tibetan students without fear. Many Chinese students are actually afraid to meet with people like me or us, right? Because they don't know who's watching. Because the consulates have actually extended some of their arm and tentacles into the university campuses. And I, I would really appreciate if uh, Congress and the administration can look into that particular problem which is happening across many university campuses, both private universities and public universities. Yes. And as an immediate measure, having establishing some kind of a, a hotline where people can report tips whenever they see these incidents. My friend and colleague who was in Canada actually was subjected to endless harassment and endless uh, hate speech, uh, intimidation. Even she received death threats uh, from from hundreds of people, and the number of comments that she received, you know, digital kind of harassment, um, she was really, really traumatized by that experience. And when I was speaking to her just yesterday, she told me her hope is that in the future, other people don't have to go through that kind of experience. I'm so glad you mentioned uh, the hotline. Uh, so I've been pushing the administration uh, to set up just such a, a hotline. And the um, reaction so far uh, has been modest. Uh, the first response I got uh, was uh, the FBI wants to just use their standard tip line. And I said, what person being threatened by folks for seas would call up a, a tip line that has to do with anything in the world, any crime in the world, not, n not knowing uh, how the information will be used, whether the person on the other end speaks Tibetan or speaks Chinese or, or understands how carefully this information has to be controlled, not to amplify the, the threat. And if we don't have a way for people to systematically report, then we're not getting just the, you know, it's not the tip of the iceberg. We're getting like, the, you know, maybe a, 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 a ten thousandth of actually what's happening in terms of, of the information we're securing. And I think for us to take on transnational repression, we have to get a, a huge understanding. There needs to be a transnational repression, a hotline 
carefully, carefully staffed uh, with multiple language abilities, multiple protections, with such confidence uh, that uh, people know uh, that it's not going to be hacked, that they're not going to amplify the problems by reaching out, that the uh, diaspora communities can circulate that information. And I think that would help us really see the, the full picture and be able to mobilize a much more aggressive uh, r response. Uh, and um, so uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I floated that idea last year, and, and um, this is the first time I've heard someone bring it up, back up before the, the, before the commission. And I'm continuing to seek feedback on it and, and partnership on it. Uh, and uh, I, I hope we, because you can no longer be free here in the United States of America if your family is being threatened uh, uh, abroad. Thank you so Thank much. You. Chairman Merkley, thank you very much, and thank you for that, that initiative. I think it's a tremendous one, and, and hopefully it'll go from modest to full in. Because <laughs> who wants to call the FBI when you have no idea, as, as somebody part of the diaspora, who you're talking to? <laughs> you know, law enforcement to them, and rightfully so, uh, is back home, is secret police, and, and uh, people who are surveilling uh, ad nauseum. You know, we also have, and I've actually chaired hearings on Confucius centers. Uh, I had one hearing with NYU uh, that has a campus in Shanghai bought and paid for uh, by the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, I actually invited myself and went over there and spoke uh, to, on human rights. But, I, you know, it's shocking how complicit um, higher education, just like the business community, is uh, with uh, the Chinese Communist Party. So, Sure, it's uh, all about money. It's all about it's money. All about money. <laughs> it's all about money. <laughs> all about money. But thank you uh, for your testimonies. This hearing and, again, these bills, which I do believe will be passed and signed into law, need to be the pivot. And uh, your voices and your incredible knowledge and, and, and depth of compassion uh, is the motivator. Uh, you have helped us to see even more clearly what has to be done, and uh, we need to pivot today. So I thank you so much. Thank you, Chairman.